Welcome to our line of opinion panelists this week. Former New Mexico State Senator Diane Snyder is with us. Attorney Sophie Martin, one of our regulars, of course, and Algernon Damasa, investigative and enterprise reporter at the Las Cruces Sun News. Thank you all for being here. Now, almost immediately after the horror that took place in Evalde, the conversation around the crisis and gun control turned political. Over the past few decades, gun rights have become so ingrained, especially in conservative identity, it seems any proposed change is met with backlash. And Senator Snyder, let's talk about this, this backlash. What needs to happen for there to just start to have a substantive discussion on gun control? What, what are we missing here just to be able to sit down, talk across the aisle about this? I think part of it, Jean, is the fact that uh, it's usually the people invited to have these discussions are from the extremes of both sides. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's how you get this, the problem solved or steps of recommendation of how some kind of compromise can take place. And I know the word compromise has become a dirty word in many, many areas of this discussion. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that in reading and looking at what's been done both in New Mexico and in other states is I think our top priority, although gun control may well be a part of it, and there are certain things that even I agree with, mm -hmm. but the focus needs to be on the actual security of those children. We should stop hitting each other back and forth about the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment is there. It would take a great effort to change it, and that may happen someday, mm -hmm. but it's not that difficult to make some legislative changes in how things proceed. And we've done that in some states. It hasn't really, it's happened some at the federal level, but I think the main thing is, and, and I'm not quite sure how you do this, is find the moderates on both sides mm -hmm. that can sit down, don't exclude the extremes on each side, but make your group more a group of moderates and, and have a discussion that nothing's off the table, but it's but nothing's on the table either. Mm -hmm. That you have, but and the goal is, you must come up with three recommendations that will increase the safety of school children and teachers. Mm -hmm. That's and you have to focus that that's what your goal is, and I think that can be done. Uh, I know that our country is split in many many, many ways, this being even one of them. But I think people are capable of making those tough decisions. And I know a large number of Republicans who are strong Second Amendment supporters that are a little more flexible on the of a deeper or more intense scrutiny of people who purchase an AR-15. Mm -hmm. And, and I believe Sophie mentioned to me this morning there, I believe it's New York State, that uh, it's a show the need and is coming up in, in, in the, Sophie can tell us more about this, mm -hmm. in the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. But she, I put her on the spot, sorry. That's all right. But She's I up think, to it. I still think <laughs> mm -hmm. you, there, I know there are people out there mm -hmm. that we can sit down and come up with yep. three simple things that will protect our children. Mm -hmm. Well said there, Sophie. Um, interesting that uh, Senator Snyder brings up the Supreme Court, because that's something I want to ask you about. I know you know this, but for some folks, this issue of ownership really took off in 2008 when the Supreme Court knocked down that ban on firearms in the District of Columbia, we might that's recall. That's right. The, the right? Heller decision that's really right. transformed our country's mm -hmm. uh, interpretation of the Second Amendment. And prior to that, prior to that time, we didn't have what we seem to have now, which is these really entrenched um, views that the Second Amendment means that nothing can be done. I, and I want to touch on something that Diane was sure. talking about um, in terms of school shooting. I think it's really important to recognize that we're not just looking at school shootings. We had the recent grocery store shooting in Buffalo. We had the Pulse nightclub right. shooting. We, you know, we have all of these, all of these, um, 
these uh, the hospital shooting, shooting in Tulsa just thank, the other day. Thank yeah. you. And a second one, as I understand, in Oklahoma as well. Mm -hmm. We have all of these, uh, I, I hesitate to say incidents because it's much worse than that. Um, but but we are, you know, if we just focus on the the infrastructure, the security in schools, we're missing the bigger picture, which is, yes, the school shootings are tragic and should be prevented, um, but they are not the only shootings that are happening. Mm -hmm. And while the Republican Party can talk about, oh, we need to harden our schools, first of all, you know, we're hearing from architects and, and school planners that that's not practical. Think yeah. about having to go through the equivalent of TSA every morning mm -hmm. to get into school. Like that's that's not practical in most contexts. But then also it, it distracts from the issue of, you know, we have too many guns in the hands of people who really should not have them. We have greater magazine capacity, greater firepower than we had. And there's a fascinating study out of the NYU School of Medicine that looks at what happened when the um, when the ban on assault rifles came in in 1994, you know, there's a, there were already a lot of assault rifles in people's hands. I think that that matches to a certain extent what we have now. Mm -hmm. but there was a slow decline following that uh, implementation of that law in 94. Yep. What's so interesting is that 2004, the ban expires, the legislation expires, and the number of shootings mass mass casualty shootings explodes that's right so so i mean i think we have actually really good data um experiential data that shows what happens when you do and don't have uh sensible gun control which from my perspective includes uh control of assault rifles mm -hmm. as we had as we had before the other thing i'll say is you know there's a great piece in the new york times right now two former Supreme Court law clerks um, talking about their own experience in the in the development of the Heller decision. And they, they were on opposite sides at that time, um, but they both say, look, the Heller decision does not mean what y'all think it means. You mm -hmm. can still enact gun control. And, um, and, and, you know, I felt the takeaway was, so we should do that. Interesting points there. Algernon, let me uh, kind of dovetail off that as well. Uh, sticking with the Supreme Court here, it seems to me the chessboard, there's an obvious move here. If another state decides they're going to take a poke at this, it would obviously kick up to the Supreme Court. <laughs> you know, and, and is that the right way to go here to kind of get this ball moving, to get the Supremes to kind of look at this again? Or is the Supreme Court so loaded one way or the other if you get my drift here, that might be not a good move either. But you see what I mean here. It, there's a way to get the ball moving here. It depends on which state's willing to do it. Yeah, and I don't know if this is the avenue that's going to bring us to practical solutions to right. the problem that we're discussing. Mm -hmm. um, the Second Amendment is a single sentence that makes explicit reference to militia service, and this is part of the argument that we've, we're sort of stuck in as far as uh, framing this as a discussion discussion about liberty, as opposed to the discussion about why is it a uniquely American problem that we have uh, endemic gun violence in public places. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm skeptical about any explanation that attributes one single solution or one single factor to that problem, of course. Um, but I do know that it is a uniquely American problem and that as long as the conversation is stuck on uh, the constitutional amendment that appears in our Bill of Rights, we're not talking about the actual problem that is leading to the deaths of masses of adults and children. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and uh, we were just discussing about the prospect of security features at schools and TSA lines and stuff like that. And, you know, this is sort of a palliative measure. It's an adaptation to madness. And, uh, it, it, you know, it doesn't address the root cause of that. And I'm just reminded of, uh, standing in a TSA line at uh, Los Angeles International Airport, 
this long line of people that would make a pretty juicy target for somebody who uh, had intentions of wanting to inflict mass violence. Mm -hmm. Plus, uh, um, you know, this was at a time when they were removing liquids from people's luggage That's because right. it might contain liquid explosive, but then discarding it in a wastebasket right next to the line where everybody was pooled up. And so there's this aspect of where some of the solutions can become theatrical, mm -hmm. uh, so-called security theater. And I think as long as we're adapting to madness and not trying to uh, actually address the sickness itself, um, we're going to be spinning around this drain. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an interesting point there. There's a meme out there on Facebook, you know, from one failed shoe bomber attempt. We're all having to suffer with this shoe thing at the TSA where no one expects any shoe bomb to be a, a real thing. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Uh, Senator, interesting, the conversation around expanded mental health services for students has, thank goodness, picked up a bit, and that would likely require more counselors in schools. And our governor has already shown her support for educators, certainly increasing pay rates across the state. Uh, you know, should she or the legislature take action that specifically targets support staff like counselors if we have to go to a scheme where there's just more security? Because again, we're asking kids to do something. It just seems like we're not thinking about the mental health aspect of, of lining up and being searched or scanned or anything like that. What, what's your sense of that? A couple of things, Gene. One is, I believe it was APS this week, extended the, the teacher level raises to counselors, nurses, and professionals like that. Mm -hmm. So I, and I think that was extremely important. They do a tremendous job and we don't have enough of them either. But I think some, maybe, and this is just a small piece, is we focus on, I always hear, oh, well, after a shooting is, oh, we brought in all these counselors to talk to everybody. Why didn't we have all those counselors before the shooting, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, with what I've read about the young men who allegedly did the killing in Uvalde, there were all kinds of signs right. prior to right. the day of the shooting. Mm -hmm. And if we had, a, if we focused on, and it, again, it's just one piece of having counselors, teachers, training our teachers just to be aware, not to have to do anything, just in the same way that we ask them to report suspected child abuse. It doesn't do anything harm if a teacher or some a counselor, whoever suspects that there is a problem right. and turn it over to the counselor, let the counselor talk to the student and move from there. Because the more and more I read about Uvalde, I just go, how did this particular incident happen right there were many many stop points along the way especially in a small community you know, it, yeah. you know i'm sure they knew him they knew what we, what he was about from the grandma as well who tragically was right. shot by him and, and his yeah. life and all those kinds of things mm -hmm. and it, there's just too much to me too much of the focus is okay we've had 21 people killed so now let's send in the counselors to take care of it mm -hmm. so i'd like to see our state legislature and as I said, it's only one piece, but I would like to see some preventive, not just follow up. Right, right. Hey, I want to kick back to uh, uh, Algernon for a quick second, if you guys will indulge me here, because you, you wrote an interesting piece following the surrounding the topic. You wrote a piece about how we label these incidents, saying the term tragedy is a misnomer of sorts. Can you explain that? I mean, it, it kind of flesh out what you wrote as well. I thought it was really terrific. Yeah, just to be clear, it's not wrong to refer to a, uh, a you know a cataclysmic event as a tragedy. And in fact, I think that that can be psychologically healthy, emotionally healthy to really frame loss uh, yeah. in, in those terms. But uh, I, I'm concerned about our, our lack of vocabulary and the fact that uh, you know an earthquake might be called a tragedy. Uh, uh, in the same quantity that a an incident that is either that, that has human origin um, can be can be framed using the same noun. And what I'm concerned about is that when we constantly speak of these tragedies, we these events as tragedies, this violence that may or may not be preventable, that is the result of human action. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know what, what what that happens is that we can 
start talking about it in a way that makes it seem like a natural event in the same way that an earthquake might be. And, um, and that can lead to a kind of quietism. It can lead to a kind of, uh, uh, you know, there's a certain repetition to these things happening again that I think dominates the need to think of these things as situations requiring solutions, requiring urgent action. Uh, I have a 14 year old son who is about to graduate from being homeschooled all his life to a public high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, in addition to all the things that we're doing to prepare him for this, I've had to have conversations with him about um, that this is an, a feature of our world. And that it, it honestly, he's not, from his questions, he's not scared. He's baffled. Mm -hmm. He's just baffled at the at the lack of a will and the, the lack of a of a of a collective ethical response to this situation, which is what prompted that piece. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Prompted me to write that piece is that through the eyes of a teenager, um, it's just, just baffling that we can't arrive at a resolve to find an ethical solution or even just have serious conversations about it. Mm -hmm. Good point, sir. I'm glad we got that in. Thank you all for that difficult conversation. I appreciate that a bunch. We'll see you all back at the virtual roundtable in a little over 10 minutes. First, the perspective of an expert educator who spent decades in the classroom and now tries to elevate discussions surrounding education's biggest issues, including school violence. Here's producer Lou DeVizio.